Yet. Sorry? The CCTV systems. Uh, it's obviously it's me that jinxes it. Jinx, is it? I think we moved you down a week. I'm not going to do it. I said I'd put you in there. Right, it's five o'clock. Uh, have a very really welcome to the meeting. Um, we've done up through the fire procedure. We've got apologies from. Can I sign the minutes of the um, first of February? All the calls are eighteen. Well done. Mm-hmm. Yep, no problem. Yeah. Get your <laughs> You're probably right. <coughs> Declarations of of interest was on the other ones. Really written. Public consultation, consultation anybody? No. But at this point, I was going to ask uh, Paula Dees, who's coming through for the CWLAP, uh, to speak to us, but she's running a bit late and at times a bit, um, she's got to be elsewhere. So hopefully, when Paula comes in, we will we'll take her and then she's got a presentation. Let's have a five minutes of questions or something afterwards and then. Mm-hmm. She can go away to our next. Uh... Okay, is everybody alright with that? <coughs> right, so we'll take uh, item number six. Megan? <coughs> okay, so we're going to the formal complaints mm-hmm. process. Um, I hope the um, format on there is straightforward enough for you. We thought we'd just run through the report. Um, <coughs> four complaints received. There's 591 complaints recorded for the reporting period, which was the 1st of April 2017 to the 28th of February 2018, um, which is an average response rate of 80%. Uh, this compares to 587 complaints for the year 2016 17, which was a response rate of 57%. Um, the table below shows the different areas where the complaints have come in for. So the number of re- received for which area, uh, the number responded to or acknowledged within 10 days, and the response responded to or acknowledged within 10 days as a percentage. Um, we brought in a new customer feedback process which went live in September 2017, which was through feedback that we got from the group. Um, so we had a number of revisions which addressed the issues that were raised before the customer feedback coordinators and the economic and corporate OSP and through a complaint review working group. Uh, the following table shows the response rate before and after the system went live. If you can see. So hopefully from the two tables you can see that since the new process came in it has made a big difference in the amount it's responded to in the particular time frame. Uh, there's a number of recommended recommendations that came through from the complaints uh, review panel. Um, <coughs> so to I've included in our itemising the quarterly performance report to SPs, those FOIs and complaints that are over a target date from completion. So that was completed. The need to review the letters and emails that are sent out to complainants, with consideration being given to include contact name rather than generic customer service currently used. So that was changed to all processes and to all complaint letters. Uh, a fundamental change required the system will give the operator the ability to reallocate items to other office systems partners as necessary. That was also added in through the feedback that we got. 
Um, it is required that each entry have a subject title as well as a reference number to enable items to be tracked through the system more easily. That was available already through the old process, but it does remain in the updated process. And, and officers need to know the named officer to contact to delete the case from the system so that do not remain on it indefinitely. Um, all cases that are put through, all complaints put through in FOIs are sent to a service area or a team. Um, so cases only remain on the system indefinitely have not been completed. So it actually forces the department to actually respond to the complaints rather than just delete them off. Um, there was also a need to ensure training is given to all officers with a coordinating and responding role, as well as a general awareness for all officers about complaints, compliments and FOIs. So the customer services team do do training to all officers that ask for it. Um, <coughs> members should also be offered training on the firm step system separately or alongside the officers. So uh, we are going to coordinate that, so if any members do want any training on the system to be able to log complaints and FOIs themselves, then they can do it. I was, was going to say it would be our ideal for induction, I yeah. think, for member induction post election. Um, all officers should be responsible to ensure that appropriate information requested from them is gathered in a timely manner to enable responses to be made within the target. Um, all, the tar all the reports are sent to the management team um, so they, they can see which people have not responded to it and hopefully take action against the ones that have not responded. Um, and the OSP to review the system again six months after the change has been implemented. So the six months is up actually yeah, about now. So we are due to re review all the changes to the system now. Thank you. Any questions? Um, one question <coughs> always people have is whether when they complain about something, whether it's treated as a complaint or not. Because people can say the council's done this or the council's not done this. And from the different numbers of complaints for different sections, that they're wildly different. Yeah? Some places like Leisure and Culture 109, others just <coughs> one, two, or three. So it's, it's a threshold for the officers to actually receive an email or phone call and consider a complaint very different because the, the difference in these numbers is very <coughs> stark. And a lot of people um, say they complain to the council, but actually, when you talk to them, it doesn't seem to have been responded as a complaint, more service request, yeah. My grades flooded, the bin lorries run over my cat or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Is there a robust way to actually ensure we actually capture as much as possible as a complaint? We encourage all complaints to come through to the customer <coughs> services. Um, so you can do that via the website by email, so everything that would come in through us. Now, there is a difference between what people would class as an official complaint, it's when the council's done something wrong, for instance, or whether it's a service request, whether they want something from us. Um, if someone's, um, for instance, if a bin's been missed, someone might see that as a complaint, but we see that as a service request, so we should be able to go out and it within two working days. So hopefully we're trying to capture, but it doesn't stop it if someone emails an officer directly, and we still encourage them officers to send it as an official complaint to us if that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully they do, but sometimes they may just respond to the customer directly. And if I just follow up to just clarify, in terms of things like insurance claims where the council's done something wrong, where the people want compensation, do they get counted as complaints? And to things to like um, democratic services, you know, you've not allowed my question at full council, and they complain, is that counted as a complaint? Um, I don't think they would go through this, the corporate complaint system. So, certainly, insurance claims wouldn't go through the corporate complaint system because that would be dealt with as a claim, unless it came through as a complaint originally. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Clearly, if it's a complaint by a member of the public saying I was to complain that I was denied the right to ask a question, then that would probably could be referred through the complaint system and be registered and given a, a number, etc. We would deal with it on that basis. So my wife's not being allowed to ask a question two councils back. That has been treated as a complaint. Um, no, that wasn't. It depends where it's directed to. Yeah. If you go through customer services, generally you will get yeah. But Philip doesn't put things on where people can No, I do, out. but I didn't put that one on because I didn't treat it as a complaint. Council Margaret. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> it's good to see that the response rates have increased on the previous year. Uh, however, 
I don't want to coin a phrase from somebody else, but they are wildly varied in relation to section of the authority. So are you happy with those figures? And, and what are we, can we be assured that they will be improving next year to the level at which we would all be happy? Um, I think it's more to do with the response that we go out to. We encourage feedback all the time, and sometimes even bad feedback is we can turn into a positive. So, um, yeah, I mean, with the response rates <coughs> particularly, that's what we want to improve on. Um, the numbers we can't really stop how many complaints come in. Um, I don't think compliments are included on this, but we no, do have quite a lot of compliments. Well, when, when I'm, sorry, Chair, when, when I was speaking about while they vary wildly, I was actually referring to the response rates. Right, so the so I, I wasn't speaking about the number of complaints we receive, mm -hmm. although uh, personally I think for the size of population we have, it is incredibly low and it does beg questions of why isn't it higher uh, and are residents having their voice heard. But my concern is about responding to complaints and personally I would like to see 100% going forward. Uh, because I, I don't think there is an acceptable reason in, in respect of why we're not responding. Yeah, certainly we want to improve on that. And yeah, you're right, we should be 100% that we're responding to within the time frame. I think we've got to start the review of the new process and understand why some people have more difficulty in completing their time than others do. It may be the, the nature of the, the subject matter. Um, doesn't necessarily excuse why they've not been actually managed by the employment um, yeah. 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 Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a bit of a plus and a minus, really. The plus for me is that actually the response rate has increased. After banging on about this for years, it's good to see that we're actually moving out of um, the 50s and 60% range to approaching 80%. So. I think the congratulations and well done needs to be passed on to the relevant officers concerned. <coughs> um, as someone who deals with complaints myself at work, I know how demanding they can be at times. Um, but with the same token, the minor side is, and I agree with Councillor Margrave on this, it says responded or acknowledged. Now I can accept a response not in, within 10 days, depending on the, <coughs> on the nature of the investigation, but an acknowledgement takes five minutes mm -hmm. and we aren't acknowledging all of those even just to say thank you for your email of complaint we expect to deal with it within I don't know 10 working days 15 working days or we require further investigation that is where we now need to tighten a lot more up on I mean at the moment I've just left work to come here and I've got three complaints on my desk and every single one has been acknowledged yeah it's a pain in the backside but that's part of my job equally as part of the job of the people's service areas and to me, it comes down to an issue of competency with the officers and the fact that they aren't actually doing the job. That is their job. Now, if I don't do my job, I'm hauled over the coals. I think it also now needs to start to be reflected in the service areas where, when they're having their PD uh, performance reviews, that that needs to start to take effect. And I'm like, without giving information, if this carries on, I think I would like to see more information to say this has been taken further because this is now a performance issue. Because it isn't good enough. At the end of the day, everyone who pays everyone's wages, including ours as, as, as councillors, is the public. They have a right to expect a certain level of standard. So, good work so far, but still got some way to go before it's actually at this level that we should be. Any other councillors before I bring Councillor Condicol back in again? Councillor? Yeah, just one quick other thing. When people put in complaint to free information requests, quite often they've got an acknowledgement or actually the information to, from a no reply email address, has that been fixed? Because it was always annoying that you had to then go back onto yeah, the switchboard or... Services, What's your custom services now? There's always a reply email address. Yeah, that was one of the things that the group, I think, picked up that we changed. Does make lots of sense. Good. So, taking the things um, that have already been said, yeah. and, you know, the, the new system's going to come out post uh, elections, it's, Obviously, they're stepping in the right direction. So we'll get a report back to this committee in another six months, and we'll mm -hmm. see which uh, way we go from there, taking into consideration what councillors said tonight. Yeah, everybody happy with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Right, uh, we'll go straight along to item number nine. Or DS. DS? DS. DS. Well, I'll put up with DS. I'll put an A on the end. DS. DS, yeah. So you, so you want to do the road? Is that what you're trying to do? I do apologise, having said I'd like to first on the agenda. Completely underestimated my travelling time, even in the school holidays from uh, from offices in Warwick. So I do apologise. Um, <laughs> 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 Here, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Chris Watkins has changed a lot since yesterday, sir. <laughs> Okay. Between the two sides. Oh, between the two sides. Two sides, those are. Okay, perfect. Um, oh, yeah, sure, we need to go. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just say apologies for having said I'd like to be first on the agenda, not getting here on time. And um, thank you for the opportunity to come along. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and just kind of do a little bit of um, information sharing, updating with, um, with, with you around the work of Contra and Workshire Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, Nanit and Pepper have certainly been with us from day one, um, which we're uh, um, eternally grateful for. Um, I've also been with Alep from day one. Um, just a little bit about me before we start, because I don't really know any of you through the work that we've done with Alep. I know Councillor and Kandaka, but I um, don't really know anybody. So, um, um, I've worked in economic development for all of my career. Um, primarily, I'm in Coventry and Warwickshire um, across the patch. I'm an economic development um, specialist, um, and primarily in um, the fields of um, inward investment, um, funding, <coughs> strategy, um, and have been, as I say, with the left from, from day one. So, been on the journey, uh, so to speak. Uh, and there we go. So, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to talk about probably those three subject areas. Not necessarily in that order, actually. I'm probably going to pick a little bit of the strategy um, up first around our objectives and a bit around the delivery and what that's meant um, for Nuneet and Bedworth and then something around the governance. Um, and, but first off, what I probably would say is um, the governance bit gets to the end and it's too late to wait in the presentation before we mention that. But uh, Councillor Harvey has been... Um, uh, you know, from day one involved in the LEP, either in its inception and when we had a small district leaders supporting um, board, when we had just two representatives of the districts on the board, um, and then more latterly um, from 2014, um, a, a actual director of the LEP board in his own right. And, and I have to say it has been hugely supportive of the work that we've done um, on, on our board, which is a private sector led board but working really really closely with the public sector so um, I do think that's worth very much acknowledging um, up front. Um, stop me if I'm giving you way too much information which you already know but I just want to do a bit of context so you get that, you get the kind of the, the, the geographical area in which we work in. We're, our population in, uh, is increasing rapidly. We're, we're, a, we're a just over 900,000 now compared to Warwickshire and Coventry's population. Um, heading in that direction. Um, I know you can't um, necessarily read all of the locations on there, but you, you will all know those um, in relation to the geographies. And the purpose of that is to kind of set the context in terms of what the LEP is here to do and the aspiration that we want to achieve for the area, but to also to be really clear that we understand the variability within the geography that we work. Um, we, we believe, from the LEP board's point of view, that the strength of the product is the collaboration between the different various components um, within within the left geography, but equally we also recognise that the distinctiveness and the difference of each respective part um, of the geography brings some of which have challenges, some of which have opportunities. So um, we, you know, we, we have a, a fairly pragmatic um, and realistic view of the capabilities and of the opportunities and of the weaknesses of the area. But we have set out for ourselves in terms of our overall aims and ambition that we want this area um, to have a high growth economy, be known as a global hub for knowledge based industries, and primarily, not just exclusively, but recognising our competitive advantage um, to be known as leading the way in advanced engineering and digital sectors. 
that isn't staged, I promise you. Sorry about that. So, there's a bit of strategic context for you. Um, and a little bit of location setting and the need and in particular the town centre highlighted in here. Those are all facts and figures that I'm sure you are um, fairly familiar with, but just always worth a reminder in terms of the strategic um, location of our particular geography. 43 direct connections um, from Birmingham Airport out to um, different markets nationally, internationally, across Europe. We can reach 500 million consumers. How important that might be going forward, that's uh, going to be an interesting one to judge. Um, but nationally, over 6 million people live within one hour's drive of Coventry City Centre using that as, as a starting point. And, and in effect, um, we can reach within a four hour travel time 98% of the UK's market consumers. There are many other ways which we can articulate the strength of our location. They're just some facts and figures that um, we, we, we've used um, just to sort of highlight that. What the each, um, and there are 38 LEPs, um, uh, so 37 of those like ourselves, each of us have been required to produce for government, and I'll leave these for you, uh, a document called a strategic economic plan. That's really to try and articulate what it is that we'd like to do and set out some clear, some clear targets and some clear aims and ambitions. And we've enshrined that in, a, in, a, in an economic plan document, uh, which is actually a, a moving document. And we know that there are sometimes occasions when you have to revise those. But at the time of writing it in 2014 and refreshing it, those are some headline figures, um, and they are ambitious, indeed, that, that we've set out um, in terms of our capability, in terms of productivity, and I can talk to you a little bit more as we've gone through the presentation about where we've gone with that as Coventry and Warwickshire, um, in terms of our GVA per head and our, and our growth rates, and that, that, that's, a, that's a good news story for looking at Coventry and Warwickshire on the whole. Um, population, as I've just spoke about, um, and, and what that looks like in terms of employment numbers, um, apprenticeships, we've had set aspirations to increase the number of startups in there. We're exceeding that target. We're currently at around 1,400 um, across the area. And again, there's a figure in there around the homes and, and the numbers that we've built. We'd like to see built by 2030. Again, recognising that's always a challenge um, and that, you know, that, that brings with it a, a whole host of other infrastructure um, issues um, should you really, really be um, heading in that direction to achieve that, that particular number. Um, just a graphic way of articulating some of, the, some of these, those objectives I've just spoken about. Again, I've talked about the increase in competitiveness. Something that kind of occurred during the creation of our plan and then the refresh. Um, I'm sure you'll all um, be more than aware of Coventry as being now designated as becoming the City of Culture in 2021. So that has a significant bearing on, on, on the economic performance of the area and opportunities within that. Um, we've set out challenges around skills and we want to invest in employment and skills provision so that businesses are well supported, uh, both at the front end of the education system um, and the middle end and indeed um, <coughs> during the process of people in employment as they go through their employment life and, and receiving the, the right level of education and training. And something around, in particular, um, the, the, the one on, the, um, on that side of the presentation, the supportive environment for businesses to grow and prosper. And that's an area in particular for, um, for you guys where I feel we've been, we've been particularly active in your geography. And I'll talk a little bit more about the impact of that um, for Nuneaton and Bedworth and how we've done that through our, through our growth hub. And that goes without saying, um, the strong road and rail connectivity um, above, across, across Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, so, um, this is a bit of a leap into uh, what, is, what, what have we done in terms of the LEP, and I'll just do a bit of a backstory before I get into this specific fund. At the time of LEPs being established um, as a private sector led public private sector partnership, there was probably very little capital funding coming through to us um, to distribute. I think over time, as LEPs became more established, and we're now in our seventh year of, of, of existence, um, government um, set out um, funding regimes for us to bid into. This is probably one of the third along the journey. 
we had previous rounds of funding called Growing Places, Regional Growth Fund, all of which we were extremely successful um, in securing, which primarily carried out um, and paid for um, capital-based um, expenditure uh, projects. Um, and a, an, a, an example of that, um, we spent money around the Tolbar Island, uh, which was a beneficiary of Regional Growth Fund. But probably where you, we've seen the most um, sort of distributive impact of funding coming through to the LEP is through this particular fund called the Local Growth Fund. It's now in its kind of third phase. Um, initially, on the first round, uh, we secured over £42 million pounds worth of investment. Um, we then, in its second phase, uh, got up to 89 um, uh, and now are sort of recalling it Growth Deal 3 because we've kind of gone through a third iteration of developing projects. We were in excess of, of £130 million. Now the key to this is basically we had to bid for the money. Uh, you go into the pot with all the other 37 LEPs um, and then you get designated your, your, your allocation. Um, so that's the kind of the headline figure. It's under the umbrella, and I don't know how much you know about this, of uh, something called the Midlands Engine, where basically the east and west of uh, the, the whole of the Midlands region have come together in effect to sort of articulate the strength of the whole of the middle of the region in the same way of the kind of the south is deemed. Um, uh, you have a kind of a, a, an understanding of their contribution to the economy. Um, the Midlands has come together and you have an, an initiative called the Northern Powerhouse. Um, in that particular space, we have, as I said at the start, set out our plan uh, to become the knowledge capital of the UK. Some of the headline projects from that, and this is going across the whole of the Coventry and Warwickshire geography, uh, and that's, that's just a list you'll see up there, kind of big portions of funding have gone into uh, major infrastructure projects, um, people on there obviously for, for your own, for your own sort of geography. Uh, but that's, that's just a range to give you an idea that they are across transport, they're across rail, they're across culture, uh, they're across the automotive, they're across advanced manufacturing, um, and they're across the further education space as well. So it's just to give you a bit of a picture without having to kind of take you through, through the whole programme and you can kind of see some of the, the figures. What I'm assuming for, for you or is of particular interest is, well, okay, how is that translated to uh, beneficial? benefit um, into the Neaton and Bedworth project. So I've just kind of picked a highlight um, in terms of uh, those particular projects um, that we know have gone funding through through the growth deal. So referred to on the previous slide, um, we are I think at the final final stages of agreeing contracts um, to the biggest allocation of funding which um, in, this, in this particular tranche for your area which is 7.6 million awarded to transforming the Neaton, which I'm assuming there is some, you know, hopefully level of understanding around the plans for the Neaton Town Centre, particularly around uh, transforming uh, the whole experience, um, you know, in terms of uh, the developments at Vicarage Street side, the, the station, um, and the public um, buildings that um, you're hoping to work on and, and, and make more attractive um, in terms of the whole <coughs> offer. Major capacity improvements worth um, uh, two million from our particular fund. I know it's the, the whole project is, is a bigger figure of near four million that you're spending. Um, indeed, on coat and arches, and just literally driven through that myself, saw all the signage up there, um, improving some of the signalling works that are going on there to help increase the flow of traffic um, in and <coughs> out of Nuneaton and, and increase that kind of ability to sort of get people from A to B and services from A to B um, and, and, and reduce some of the travelling and congestion issues. The Neaton, Kenilworth Rail, Knuckle, um, 1.8 million and then 1.5 million awarded to what a project, I think the kind of a broader title um, called Getting West and Neaton Moving, the Bermuda Connection, which is again kind of bridge works um, uh, as far as I understand and forgive me because I'm not an expert on all the specific projects, I, I pretty much just know the headlines around around these allocations. So overall, I think taking into account these particular projects, um, and then subsequently when I come on to talk about the growth hub, and you know the large scale ambitions and plans for transforming um, Nuneaton, um, I think you know we, we're, we're really keen to make sure that that money that has come through the LEP route, which is predominantly money which has then subsequently gone uh, in the main to public authorities to do the required works, um, we believe that will hopefully 
add some level of impetus and contribution <coughs> towards you know, the large scale ambition um, that you have for your locality. I just want to take a little bit of a moment um, to sort of talk about um, a couple of case studies. Um, I'm probably just flicking back, I think I probably. No, I didn't. I want to perhaps sort of take a little bit of time to look at this. Um, one of the things we did early on um, with, with the LEP, and it was part of one of our, say, our earlier sort of funding tranches under City Deal, is we established something called um, the Commentary and Workshop Growth Hub. Um, and within that, it's an umbrella um, agency that basically tries to take the noise out of the system for any business um, looking to receive business support. And we've worked extensively um, on your patch with um, Alan and the economic development team here around really trying to sort of harness the intelligence that you guys have about your own businesses here um, as a way to try and reach the businesses more effectively and signpost them toward the relative. And I'm not pretending it's, um, it's simple, it isn't. If I, you know, we've hopefully simplified it more, there's lots more to be done. But there are over, probably in excess of 100 business support products. So it's ever likely that businesses don't necessarily know instantly which particular product it is they need. Through our growth hub and working, let's say, with Alan and the likes of economic development team uh, here, we've tried to sort of really go forensic into who are the businesses that need the help. Um, and I think, you know, we've seen a definite increase in being able to reach those businesses that have asked for help. I think the figures the last time I looked um, were uh, in excess of over 100 companies working extensively with, you know, as I say, with our growth hub in trying to sort of reach, reach those businesses. <coughs> um, there are a couple of case studies up there. Um, you guys already have here um, fantastic global businesses um, that, you know, put you on the map. Um, Holland, Merritt, Triton, Showers, you know, glo global names. But in reality, for the whole of Coventry and Warwickshire, the vast majority of our business base, in fact, about 98%, is made up of small to medium-sized enterprise. They are the industries that need the help. And here are two you know, really good examples of where we've gone in as a team, we've helped these particular businesses, and these are the kind of benefits that you've seen in terms of, um, you know, the, the hopefully the, the assistance that's, that, that, that has gone into the, gone into the economy. Um, Arrowsmith Engineering, you know, really well-known engineering company, um, working, you know, with them, um, you can see kind of the additional square footage that they've brought um, and extended the business, um, access to grants of £450,000 and seeing the investment um, into the area. Joko Interiors, I don't know this particular business, but again, um, through, through the work of the Growth Hub, you know, providing real-time help um, to businesses um, in terms of you know, what this particular individual wants to do, helping them with digital bills, digital business skills um, and really trying to sort of drill down into what is it they need in terms of help their businesses to grow. So, uh, a bit of a chart here which um, you know, is, is high level and I'm not going to apologise for that but in terms of taking a kind of a Coventry and Warwickshire perspective and, and the contribution that each respective part makes to that performance some recent data that we've just, um, you know, we've, we've just we've just come across, and there are lots of many ways that this can be articulated. <coughs> but I think what it does reflect is that Coventry and Warwickshire, as a totality, is in a really really good good place. Um, the dotted line across the middle shows the UK's average growth, and if you refer back to our my previous slide, which was the aspiration around growing um, our GBA growth above national national average uh, of by I think we would sort of said. It, Three, at least three percent. You can see here, um, since 2009, we've enjoyed year-on-year -year productivity growth rates. Um, we are, as a LEP area, um, grow, our growth rate in that average growth rate sense is at 28.4 percent. I'm not pretending I can read it off there. I'm actually reading it off here. Uh, it's 28.4 percent. So you, you can see that our actual sort of growth experience is really, really positive. And I'm being really clear with you, I do understand that that is not necessarily um, as a result of one particular area um, being 
the best. You know, that is a combination of everybody's contribution and recognising that within that there are certainly very, very variants, variances. But that said, in terms of us as a, as a geography, um, we've, we've got an overall really positive performance. I keep going the wrong way. So, um, this is probably, some of these presentations, it depends which way you want to go around doing this, but I've kind of left this to the end because you can often get, get a bit a bit stuck on it. When we were set up, um, you know, the, the, old, the whole rationale from, from government was um, work at your spatial level which you think makes most sense for us, that was in Warwickshire, work, you know, within the confines of the right organisations and individuals within those organisations, um, joining your board um, so that you have got a collective will to remove the economic barriers for growth. And I think, you know, what I would say about this, you know, this is, this is, this is the public sector side and the, the FE and the HE side. Um, the next slide shows you the private sector, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, is, uh, we basically couldn't have done this without the public sector. In effect, this is national government money coming into a private sector-led body of which the public sector bodies are members and directors of a board and without without their influence and their and speaking on behalf of you know certainly Dennis's role that he has played um, this you know this wouldn't have been possible so the board in essence was you know it's 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 well it's got to it's a board of 18 now we started originally having a board of 16 but I think under Jonathan Browning's uh, leadership, uh, we actually extended for every single district to become a formal director on the board. Um, so th the essence of the list is to sort of illustrate that, yes, there are two distinct sides of the board, <coughs> but it's the collaboration and the kind of the, the hybrid of the two, which in effect makes the board, um, board the success that it is. Um, these are the private sector board directors, just so to give you a, a little bit about that. Um, uh, you've obviously um, got on there our chair and vice chair. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jonathan Browning has been the chair since 2014. We had two previous other chairs, one of whom was uh, an entrepreneur from Stratford called uh, Dennis Short, who ran, um, uh, who still runs a successful business called um, Enable um, um, and Envisage. And uh, we were there, he was then subsequently uh, uh, succeeded by Sir Peter Rigby. Um, Coventry Airport, um, SS, SCC, um, and Jonathan is our third chair, who is ex-VW, ex-automotive, ex-Jaguar Land Rover, um, and currently without, he, he's not in employment, he's kind of left, um, uh, so he's basically um, without a, an anchor organisation. Nick Abel, um, who is uh, chairman of Wright Hassel, a law firm based um, in Leamington, um, actually just, pre, just currently awarded uh, regional law firm of the year, of which he's very <coughs> proud. Um, Grant Thornton, national organisation. Um, obviously, Carl is from, is locally from the Patch uh, um, Accountancy. Um, <coughs> indeed, an Nuneaton based Burgess and Burke, who are um, accountancy firm. Sean Farnell, I'm sure many of you will have, have come across. Very active, very representative, very, very um, supportive of locality, very supportive of the SME. Um, a particular voice and is our chamber and FSB representative. Paul Keogh, um, it was the former chief executive of Birmingham Airport, remains on our board, um, has just recently left Birmingham Airport. Sarah Windrum um, is a IT and digital uh, uh, company um, based out in Leamington, but really, really helpful in terms of uh, the, the emphasis that is now on um, uh, digital. Mike Crone uh, is director at Jaguar Land Rover. And Samaraj Hussain uh, has just recently uh, joined the board, uh, replacing, uh, who was previously on the board, um, Catherine Malian from the Royal Shakespeare Company. So as you can see in there, what we've tried to make sure is that we've obviously got um, a, a representative um, sample of businesses and industry, um, both geographic and reflecting the, the small to medium sized enterprise um, business base, but also reflecting some of the strengths, um, and in particular around um, Jaguar Land Rover. Um, that's it on a page, you guys will get this presentation, but we do try and articulate 
how it all fits together um, and shows you um, and, and shows you where it all fits. It's not easy reading um, off a slide, so I wouldn't expect you to look at it. I, I guess for illustrative purposes, um, the point just to pull out on that particular slide is during our journey uh, uh, of establishment um, and stay on the top level, the green box on the, on the top um, on the top level um, is actually the, the representative around the combined authority. <coughs> Um, and again, um, as that became established, we were uh, probably around uh, three or four years, no, about four years old when the Combined Authority came into being. And the Neaton and Bedworth, um, certainly at the inception time of the Combined Authority, were hugely supportive around us becoming a non-constituent member. And indeed, uh, I think you were one of the first of the districts to become a non-constituent member on that board. The reason for sort of registering the combined authority is that cha that has changed the landscape slightly. Um, we were probably a kind of a forerunner to um, becoming a beneficiary of devolution. You've now got a mayoral combined authority where government probably, in terms of thinking about devolution of funds, is wondering you know how that how that equates in terms of having um, a spatial level of the let and and, and a mayoral combined authority. Um, we're very active on that. Um, our chairman. Jonathan Browning chairs a couple of the sub-boards. Um, uh, there's a very active non-constituent uh, group that, that, that Dennis um, sits on and attends all of the, the main boards. Um, so we feel like we, we play a very, very active role. Um, it's an interesting dynamic, you know, around the constituent and non-constituent sort of relationship. And I think over time, as we see that become a, a more of a mature partnership, um, we'll probably see some of the shift in emphasis um, around constituent and non-constituent um, membership. Um, I think finally what I would conclude on, um, and there is a, one of our boards on Monday in fact, uh, uh, which unfortunately Dennis, I think will be his last meeting because he's obviously um, stepping out of uh, a public uh, um, don't know, politics, so he, won't, he unfortunately won't be at our board. But what I would conclude with, over, over time we are subject to um, scrutiny from government if you like uh, it's called something an annual conversation in our board papers that I have that have gone out uh, we had our annual conversation at Christmas and in terms of the kind of the, the three headlines that uh, were set we were given designations and uh, you know we were basically earmarked for having exceptional strategy good delivery and, and good governance uh, uh, that's probably notwithstanding uh, the chair is wanting to know why we didn't get exceptional in all three uh, which I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be debating greatly at, at board, but uh, as, I, uh, as I understand it, uh, no one left got exceptional in all three. There's a surprise. Um, but what I would probably want to leave you is, in terms of track record, to, on those three particular aspects of our performance, um, we are deemed um, to be well regarded by national government. Um, I think I've probably stressed to you, whilst it is a private sector chaired board, the reality is, to do the kinds of things that we have been charged with doing and the ambitions that we have set out, that would not have been possible without the cooperation and the support and the collaboration um, between both the public and the private sector. So I, you know, I'd, I'd want to very much stress that that is actually the very essence of, of the success of our particular local enterprise partnership. So hopefully I've, um, I've took you on a very quick journey of seven years. Um, I've tried to illustrate you know, the actual tangible financial benefits that are starting to sort of now come forward for, for the Neaton and Bedworth um, and give you a bit of a flavour of um, the success the success of the partnership. I'll stop there. Thanks for that, Paula. It's a double sight of, of what, what is actually happening. Yeah. Which within the, as we used to say, the old sub regional. Yes. Thing with all absolutely, that stuff yeah. Now, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's. Paula's actually got to uh, leave us very, 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 very soon. Can we have a couple of que quick questions and then we'll thank her for her attendance? Anybody got any questions? Come to my bed. Thank you, Chair. Can I begin? First of all, I want to thank Paula for the presentation today. 
it's really helpful. I'm actually an academic looking into entrepreneurship, and so oh, I, found the, I know the work of LEPS across the whole okay. uh, spectrum. Chair, could I just begin by saying I was very disappointed this wasn't on the agenda today, uh, because local people may have wanted to come along to hear this or to ask questions. So I do think that is disappointing, and hopefully next time Paula comes uh, and we get a presentation that, that it will be made available to let the public know. In relation to just three very quick points, in relation to connectivity, yeah. I wondered, obviously Nuneaton and Bedworth, uh, one of our biggest problems is that if people want to use public transport, it's very expensive. Yeah. And once you get into Coventry, uh, you then have to pay yeah. again. And I, I wonder whether there was any progress on looking at possibly joining Centro or any talk. In relation to the number of new businesses and the work of the Growth Hub, yeah. I just wondered how many startup supports su had been supported in the Neaton and Bedworth and, and what was on offer really. If somebody out there today yeah. wanted to start a business, because yeah, yeah. that's really important yeah, yeah. in creating yeah. an ecosystem. Yeah. And finally, just in relation to uh, the town centres, uh, I don't think everybody has heard a great deal about the work. Uh, that's going forward. There's some some detail, but I think oh, okay. one question. And this transforming the yeah, and I program. think I think one question is, and the, the Federation of Small Businesses has raised sort of the democratic deficit of LEPS, yep. and how ordinary everyday yeah, members yeah. who aren't leaders of authorities can get involved. Yeah, yeah. And I just wondered what the LEP could do yeah. to engage ordinary everyday yeah. backbench councillors. Okay, all right. Come on, Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wonder if I could have a little bit of rationale just behind um, sort of trying to become a knowledge capital. Yeah. Um, because to me, when you think about economic hubs around the country, as yeah. soon as someone says the words knowledge, you automatically think M4 corridor, yeah. Oxford, Cambridge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reading, sure. Cambridge Science Park, yeah, yeah. very well established. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, re I really like the concept of the Midland, Midlands engine and the fact that that sort of ties in sort of yeah. our heritage of like automotives, engineering, that kind yeah, of yeah. thing. And I just. I just worry with the knowledge side of it that we're almost trying to pinch above our waist a little bit while okay. we're trying to compete yeah, yeah. with an area like that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to do? No, we can deal with the. Do you want me to do those? No, we can deal with the questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Calls the Ponder Clark. I always call you the Coventry and South Yorkshire Lep, which I know annoys you. Um, but fundamentally, I don't think we're benefiting enough from the Lep. We've had presentations from the Growth Hub. After two years, the Growth Hub produced 20 times the inward investment into Stratford Avon as it did into Nuneaton and Bedworth. So we, we're clearly struggling. You had a nice chart there of GVA, gross added value. The gross added value on your chart went from 30,000 to 80,000. In Nuneaton and Bedworth, the gross added value is 20 something mm. thousand. Mm. We have a serious problem here. Mm. And as a LEP and a region, it's very easy to go to the areas where you've got the universities and the mm. JLRs yep. and produce growth. And the difference is getting worse and worse. We're paid £100 a week less in the Neaton and Bedworth mm. than people are in Coventry. Mm -hmm. Not a long way away, just going from the Neaton and Bedworth mm -hmm. to Coventry <coughs> yeah. in terms of jobs per location of where the jobs yeah. are. In terms of the population, the population here has well-paid jobs because we're driving to Warwick and Coventry and mm. uh, we just lack the actual mm. jobs within yeah. the borough. 28,000 full-time jobs in the borough and 17 or 18,000 part-time <coughs> jobs, which is exactly the same as what it was when yeah. you started. Yeah. We, are, we, we are totally failing in all this money you're pumping in on projects to actually create any work. And you're doing some great stuff in other parts. The, the Stratford upon Avon, Ventura House and things. There's all sorts of good things happening, but it's not happening in this borough. And I'm getting more and more frustrated that the vast amount of money being spent, the 110 million on toll bar, and then the money on the, in the borough, is being spent on road projects to drive more people living here to work in Coventry or Warwick or whatever. We're not getting the things that actually anchor some work into the borough or some education into the borough. The various projects have been very much failures. The, the, the Bermuda Connect project is actually more of a road project causing more harm on a community. The Curtin Arches project might be quite good, but was just one bit on a dual carriageway and will just move congestion along. And the Transforming the Neaton project, from what I can see, is a marvellous £18 million project 
we've only got the seven million pounds for the de demolition to get to clear the ground. So you can see the, the glass is half full, the glass is half empty. There's uh, so much to do, and we are not getting those employment opportunities. We, the, the rail upgrades, great opportunity to get a train every twice an hour to Coventry and all sorts of things. But so far, all we've done is a station at Bermuda in the middle of nowhere, and actually the trains to Coventry now take three or four minutes longer. Yeah, we're actually going backwards at the moment. And the Midlands Engine, Midlands Connect idea of a Coventry to Leicester train service is to put a dive under the Neaton so the trains don't have to stop at the Neaton. You can, we are going backwards. We, we had a great train service to London, the West Coast Main Line, the Liverpool trains, used to stop at the Neaton. When they reformatted the, the service in 2008, the Liverpool trains now race through the Neaton without stopping. We, we, we're just going backwards and backwards. And I see all these presentations and it just drives me mad because we need a presentation about what goes on in the Neaton and what we're going to do in the Neaton in the future and what growth hub stuff is going on in the Neaton and this 12 million or 18 million you're going to spend in the Neaton, why are we going to create no jobs out of it? Why are we just making more traffic, more pollution and then building more houses? Houses without jobs just equals more out commuting and more environmental problems. We actually want to traverse those commuting flows and build jobs. Okay, there's, um, before you answer those questions, there's a call to my grave. I was supposed to be at the, the West Midlands, um, uh, the CA scrutiny, scrutiny overview last time, but uh, Chris Watkins went to my place because I'm obviously here doing the, the, the interview stuff. Uh, and we were, we thought cheekily we would ask for somebody to come along. And it wasn't the, the fact that I was pre-planned or anything. We thought, when, when we get a chance, we will take the chance. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's wonderful that Paul has come along tonight to give us what we've got to the present day, uh, what, at the present moment. But yes, in the future, it should be more publicised so people can actually see what was happening. So, do you mind that, Paula, would, would you try I'll and... give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I think I absolutely support your point and the point about the scrutiny presentation, the presentations about the LEPs at the combined authority level. Mm. I think there was a very much a feeling that LEPs aren't under scrutiny by the combined authority. They're not... That is not the relationship, and I'm hoping that the, this kind of scenario that we're in here today, I'm amongst friends and working together, because at LEPS, uh, you know, Dennis is a director on a company, and I'm coming here today to articulate some of the kinds of things that we're doing together, and I'm more than happy to go and speak publicly to residents, etc. more than happy to do that, but I just want to kind of set some of the parameters around the conversation that we're having in here in a kind of scrutiny stroke let's have a information update and share session really your question about centro um, I, again i don't know the answer to that from the discussions that i think i observe and i'm saying it as an observer in the combined authority is that there is there is an appetite to harmonize pricing there is clearly different transport authority arrangements there's definitely a political will to try and make sure that some of those benefits that the constituent authorities get as being part of uh, you know, a central arrangement um, permeate into non-constituent areas. There's an initiative called the, the SWIFT card, which I know for sure has been rolled out into Redditch, and they've kind of tried to put the infrastructure in behind that to sort of to try and get away from some of those variability of prices. When madness, you go from one part of your region into the next and immediately the price goes up. So I, I don't know about the, the question. I think that will take quite a significant shift in uh, political discussions to get you to that point. Uh, but what I do know on a very practical level is there is an appetite to try where possible to sort those kinds of issues out. Startup numbers um, in terms of uh, the growth hub, I don't have the data at that level. I can definitely get it for you and I, I can email it to you. Um, I would say on the, on the startup side, um, <clears throat> we tend to, as a generality, have high numbers of startups, 
and then really when we get to the next stage and you're going to know this from an academic point of view it's the tail off and, and, and you're right it's the level of support that we can provide and give that means those businesses then survive beyond beyond their startup rate but I can definitely find find you find you that number um, the transforming the Neaton and uh, program uh, I would still actually say, and uh, you know, I'm, we have only just been invited onto the establishment of, an, of a, a small programme board that I think has been set up between, well, it has been set up between the county and, and, and the district and, 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 and Berra. Um, it's still in its really, really early stages. So the points that you're making around, you know, the consultation and what it is it's, it's geared and set up to do, well, that, you know, they are still to be decided. So we need to listen and hear more around what the expect, what you know, of the wider expectation is for that particular program. And I absolutely understand the proportion of money against the total cost of the program. Yes, it's small, but the actual proportion of money that is coming through LEPs in general and the allocation across projects, you know, proportionately for Coventry and Warwickshire, it's pretty much um, you know taking into account the whole of the geography. Um, you know, it, it's it's not unfair. There, there are there are there are clearly other projects at the start of the establishment of the LEP that benefited, and that was around the way the funding <coughs> needed to be bent, because that's the requirement that government set upon us around how the, how the funding needs to be allocated. So I'm not saying I disagree with you, but I'm saying there are rationales behind that. I, your point, uh, I think it's fascinating that. that the, the kind of the observation that you've made around why knowledge capital of the UK, and we we have arrived at that based on based on a rationale around our our strengths and um, you know the understanding of, of what our particular offer would mean in terms of securing funding for for opportunities. If you take our particular knowledge assets um, and you take our overall economic performance, actually um, we should we should be doing even better there, than we are because actually. Um, take the kind of the Cambridge, the Oxford sort of uh, localities. Uh, both universities are globally renowned. We have over 50,000 students um, going through both of those institutions. Each of those have associated uh, a few what we would call them um, knowledge assets. Um, Warwick Manufacturing Group for, for the University of Warwick, the National Automotive Innovation Centre, um, uh, also related to, to the University of Warwick. Coventry University has a national design uh, Centre for, tran uh, for Transport and Technologies. It has health-related um, institutions. It's just opened up a health um, and life sciences building with the most brilliant, leading, first-class, um, simulated uh, learning for nurses, doctors. Um, inside. So we have the competitive edge, and that's the rationale. Now, comparatively, we tend to, in that, in that scenario, Take the southeast and the south out of the, out of the equation because they're their own economy, and in, you know the rest of the UK, England, you, you ne we're never going to catch up in the way in which you know the gap that you're describing. You've got to take them out of the equation. But <coughs> distinctively for us as Coventry and Warwickshire, put in the Midlands context, the concentration of those assets, and not least in this particular part of the world, and um, if you take for example Myra huge expansion planned there in terms of their south 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 part of their enterprise zone that in effect and you're talking about job opportunities for local people that offers a huge opportunity for people the residents of Nuneaton North Warwickshire to be able to benefit from from that kind of automotive um, specialist um, specialist development and strangely, he represents the people who were closest to Myra in this town. So, so. Um, have I the democratic deficit? I've just I remembered. I recall that, and the kind of the um, the way in which we can engage. And there's always more that we can do to reach those people that you know. I think you are sort of saying, and we and we get that we can't reach everybody. Um, so the bottom level um, of that particular diagram, there are there are business groups, and the SME one in particular is led by Sean Farnell, as I've said, who's on who's on our on our board and, and from from your particular part of geography. But he's also attended by both the uh, chamber and FSB um, executive functions. 
Um, and uh, you know, over time, uh, we have done in the past um, very bespoke, focused, geographical SME sessions. Um, happy to do more of those resource dependent. Um, happy with any, if you've got any referrals and you want us to speak to them, more than, again, more than happy to do that. I, I'm really mindful. The, the, I haven't gone into the kind of the executive and secretariat. We're a pretty small team and our reach, as I've said, is predominantly through our public sector partners who, you know, through the growth of, through the economic development functions of your own, your own institutions, that's how we try, we do try and engage. Um, but we, we know there's always more that we can do. Thanks, um, thanks for that, uh, Paul. I um, understand you've got to leave us now. Uh -huh. but, but just, but just said, thanks for coming along to try and, to try and explain what's rather a complicated situation yeah. with, with the combined authority yeah. and various <laughs> other things that's happening at the present moment. Uh, some the authority was thrust upon, and some were actually engaged in it from from the beginning. Yeah. So, thanks for that, You're and um, I'm sure. I'll leave you with some presents, products, um, and you've got my contact details, so yes. if there's any specifics that you want me to follow up on, I'm happy to do that as well. Thanks for coming. Okay. Can I just make the point, the universities, we really need an express bus service from the Neen to the University of Warwick, because you talk about hours travel time and things, if you were to go to the bus station here and try and get to the University of Warwick, yeah. And that's where we're disconnected. And South Yorkshire has brilliant express bus services, the X18. Yeah. We just don't get that here. I'll add it on my shopping list. <laughs> okay. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very much. That would be the, the last presentation we get from the combined authority or, or from the left. It's something, and well, I wasn't mentioned earlier, early, earlier on, but Brexit might have a massive impact to what's going to happen in the future, but we we'll are just have to take that to the point. Right, uh, item number seven, then, Philip, are you taking this? It's yes, Chair. Um, Craig, can um, has which is apologies obviously with it being uh, end of term he has uh, other duties so I said I would deal with his report so um, we have uh, a report which is our annual report on our performance against the um, particularly the public sector equality duty that is placed upon us as a council um, there is a there's a general description which is in section three of the report and uh, of the compliance report then is dealt with in section four and appendix A gives you uh, a, a breakdown of our performance against uh, the objectives that we've set ourselves. Um, I wasn't going to go through that in any detail, allow members to raise any questions on that. Uh, one thing I was just going to pick up on was uh, Council Building Accessibility on page 38. Um, and just to say, as you will see, there are a number of um, assets that are identified there. Some are in progress of being improved. Johnson Pavilion in, in Bedworth and Baldwin Pavilion uh, in Nuneaton. Uh, clearly, St Mary's Road Depot will be an issue no longer once um, uh, it is decommissioned. Uh, Millwalk toilets similarly and of course there will there are steps to address Wandering um, Pavilion as well so we, we hope that we will be actually making quite significant inroads into uh, accessibility for our assets. Um, since the report has been produced uh, Craig tells me that the number of employees trained will have increased due to some additional sessions that have recently been held at the Town Hall and at the Depot uh, and we'll be, we're in the process of updating the statistics on those. Um, the equality booklet for um, staff is to be um, issued in the current financial year, so from 1st of April, uh, we're just in the process of having that prepared by our graphic design team. Uh, and lastly, um, we've acknowledged 
that there are some there is some work to be done on both housing and human resources in terms of data uh, on, uh, for quality monitoring, particularly in terms of tenants and employees. In, as, as you can imagine, uh, there's no obligation on people to provide information, but clearly the better the information we have, the better we can redesign or, or, or um, uh, amend our services to address any specific issues. Um, what tends to happen, we will deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis as when they present themselves, but clearly there, there are probably missed opportunities to design services for particular groups that we have, we're not picking up. So we're aware of that and we want to look at that to see what we can do to improve on that. I wasn't going to say any more than that, Chair. Uh, obviously, if members have any questions, I'll endeavour to answer them, or I will um, take them away and I'll ask Craig to come back with a formal written response, as the case may be. Council Margrave. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to pick up with something else first. I've got a few questions and a contribution to make on this. But I want to pick up on the, the thing that you just said, uh, Philip, is that in, in relation to dealing with things on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, we actually have an anticipatory duty as a local authority. And so actually, uh, what concerned me about this document, Chair, uh, is it is quite thin, and I feel that it doesn't consider fully all of the things that we need to be thinking about in relation to uh, both people who are disabled, but the wider characteristics uh, in relation to our duties under the Equality Act because we do have, as I said, an anticipatory duty. Uh, and, and I think that is important. So it's, it, I would be concerned about picking things up on a case-by-case -case basis. We should have already considered them beforehand. In relation to uh, buildings that were mentioned on 38 and 39, uh, in relation to the town hall, I have raised it before. The council chamber itself, because we haven't spoken about councillors, is not accessible. And I have raised concern that if a, a, a councillor was elected who uh, was a wheelchair user, it's been in the past, but the council chamber now, within the law, should be adapted in some way. But also, I've mentioned previously about changing places, toilets within our buildings. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to consider. Finally, in relation to training, and this is a question, uh, how many councillors have undertaken a training in relation to understanding their own public sector equality duties uh, and the public sector equality duties of this authority because they are the policy makers. So it's, while it's useful to our staff to go and it's an important part of their role, we also need the leaders of the authority and the policy makers to attend. So I wonder whether has anything happened and if not, could it be built into the new members' training? <coughs> Uh, I'll, I can answer the, the second question, mm -hmm. Chair. Um, yes, training has been provided to members. We have done corporate governance training, part of which incorporated the uh, equalities obligations and the public sector equality duty. Um, obviously, it's a matter of engagement. Only those councillors that choose to attend will have attended. Um, but um, it is available. We will be repeating that as part of member induction. So we will pick it up at that stage with new members as they come in as well. The, the final issue then, Chair, is just around equality and diversity impact assessments. Because equality and diversity, although it sits in this document, actually should be the golden thread that goes for everything that we do as a local authority and really needs to take account of not just things such as staffing or things such as our building, but it's about how we interact with our service users or customers, as some people call them, uh, and e equally, it's about the community that we create, and I want to see an inclusive community here in the Neiman Bedworth. So I just wondered whether we've looked at how we deal with in equality impact assessments and whether we could develop those, because I don't feel that this document, or having seen previous equality impact assessments, that, you know, that we're really leading the way with some kind of innovative exemplars of what can be achieved. Uh, and so I just wondered whether officers might take up the opportunity just to develop equality impact assessments to really understand, the so that local members, when making decisions, really understand the impact on people, whether that be disabled people or whether it be 
uh, women. I've noticed in here that there's a gender pay gap within this authority. So I want policies when we're making decisions to reflect that so we're fully informed. Chair, um, as it says in, uh, in the report, paragraph 5.2, we, we are in the process of refreshing our uh, schedule of quality impact assessments. Um, we do do uh, 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 equality impact assessments, um, obviously on anything which we consider to be of significance in terms of any changes or policies, uh, we do go through an impact assessment process. Um, if I can give you just one example, if I can um, mention uh, when we changed the car parking arrangements, which was obviously one of our key objectives, um, we did a, a, a fairly detailed impact assessment on those changes to see that it was um, uh, or didn't um, uh, have a, a disproportionate impact on any particular uh, group with uh, any protected characteristics and, and I think we were satisfied in the, in, right, yeah. in the overall uh, scheme of things it was okay and we proceeded on that basis. So, but as you'll see, we, we, we do do uh, a, a refresh of that uh, periodically, about every three years, and we are in the process of doing that again. So, uh, it, it's uh, something that we will do. Uh, I think it's very common to, 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 to keep it in the forefront of our minds, because um, there is a danger of making decisions without that, but uh, we are alive to it, and whenever we see anything that we think requires it, we, we are immediately <coughs> contact Craig and ask him to review and give us an opinion on whether it does actually need a screening assessment first and then a full impact assessment after that. Also, also, thank you, Chair. Um, I remember raising the issue with Councillor Margrave before about the disabled access to the chamber and nothing seems to have been done about it. Um, there is the lift by the opposition entrance but that only gets someone into the chamber. It doesn't give them either a councillor or, or an observer, actually, the opportunity to participate in the democratic process properly. Um, I remember when uh, Councillor Emma Taylor was on the authority. Um, now, although we were different politically, we got on quite well outside of the chamber. And when she um, was quite ill, before she stepped down from the council, I felt, personally, that the way that she had to be wheeled in and out of the chamber was degrading. It really was. Um, and if it were me, I, I would have wanted the, the ground to open up and swallow me whole because I felt it was so inappropriate in this day and age that someone trying to exercise their democratic right, either as a councillor or a, as an observer, a member of the public, to try and see what is going on. We don't live stream our um, proceedings, so people don't even have that route to even try and participate if they wanted to. Um, and it seems as if the comments that we have made in this room haven't been taken forward. So I want to move a formal uh, recommendation to Cabinet that Cabinet is requested to investigate all options to make the Chamber disability, not just access, but participation friendly as well. You can wheel someone in, but where are you going to put a member of the public? You can't sit them with us um, because of our safety. That's happened before and, and officers were told off <coughs> people in the, in the councillor's seats, if you put them behind them, because of the raised nature of the council chamber, they couldn't see anything. What's the, they'd be there in, in body, but what, what, what can they do? They could listen, but they couldn't see what's going on. So I think it's an issue that this council needs to get a hold of, because it's not fair for anyone. So I think Cabinet, need, we now need to be a bit stronger as a committee, and formally resolve to Cabinet, we want them to do this. There's got to be some money in some reserve somewhere to make this happen. I'll second that, Chair. Councillor Condicor. It was on a different matter, so I don't know if you want to do this vote first or... Well, you want to... Just, just to respond to that, Chair, I know that the portfolio holder has looked at this and there was a discussion with our corporate property colleagues in terms of what would be a workable solution. Um, and I believe that some proposals had been uh, tentatively put forward, but I don't know uh, whether or not there was a, a, a desire at this stage to bring those forward. Um, it would seem sensible for the recommendation to go forward to Cabinet and Cabinet can then consider it. I, I think we now need something to <coughs> <coughs> yeah. 
I was going to make a couple of points. Um, one on the gender pay gap. I believe it's a lot larger on some authorities, so obviously there's a little bit of work to do to, to get it down here, but we've actually rated one of the better ones in Warwickshire in terms of gender pay gap. Um, but it's obviously something we need to keep an eye on, particularly not just the pay gap, but actually how well different genders can actually get up the organisation, because it's not just how much each role is paid, but obviously a lot of these gender pay gap issues is about promotion and glass ceilings and things like that. Um, on a different subject, we really need, if we're looking at sorting out access to bus stations and all this stuff, also our council flats. A lot of them now have the ground floor people with mobility problems and we haven't sorted out all the ramps and all the sort of pavements um, as much as we should nowadays, particularly for people on buggies. Um, no, they're not adopted roads or pavements around places like Cleaver Gardens. <coughs> uh, we, do sh we should actually do a bit more of an audit around places like Cleaver Gardens to actually make sure that they're <coughs> friendly. That, that, that'll be a matter for, um, but we'll take that back to our housing colleagues and deal with that. In terms of the gender pay gap, Chair, uh, I was looking on the BBC website, and according to BBC, we don't have a gender pay gap. We're smack bang on in the middle. Um, uh, I did clarify with my HR colleagues that, in fact, we do have a <coughs> slight, uh, I can't remember if it's the mean or the median. One is naught. I think the median might be naught, uh, but the mean might be 6.1% or something. However, in terms of it being a gender pay gap, I think it has to be borne in mind that, in fact, it's not actually a, 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 a difference in gender that generates that. It's a difference in jobs, and it's just whether you have a preponderance of females or male employees fulfilling those particular roles that gives rise to that. Um, my, having implemented the single status agreement, we actually have a unified pay scale, so all jobs have been graded against that pay scale. So in reality, there is no dis disparity in terms of gender pay, but it's just the fact that there are certain jobs, cleaning jobs, for example, which are, uh, tend to be occupied by women, for want of a better term, um, and that's the, the nature of they those jobs have been um, assessed and, and valued at a particular level, as opposed to a, 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 a job that may not be um, as uh, attracted to that person because of the hours that they are available because they're usually five till seven in the evening or something like that. Also, Oh, well, Chairman, as someone who's uh, worked with someone in a wheelchair in and around this building for many years, I must say that the Council Chamber presents a significant challenge to any amendment that you would want to make. Any ramps that are put there on the understanding that it's the best that can be done is not adequate and you, you just can't get round it. And you, you will, I think, if you do actually crack this in the end, wind up with a significantly changed chamber. And, and it's almost as though you've got to lower the floor to get the chamber to a position where suitable arrangements can be made for a wheelchair user to be able to access any part of the chamber. And as for the public space, that's, that is impossible, isn't it? You know, short of having lifts which are on the external side of the building and then hoisting them up to the top and moving them into uh, a public space which is itself like a coliseum arrangement, then I just can't see any way in which you're going to easily resolve it. And uh, the return on investment, other than the satisfaction of having done a good job, is very, very difficult to justify, especially in these straightened times. So I'd, I'd suspect that schemes will be drawn out which have been drawn up before, <laughs> cost and benefit have been evaluated, and there is a very difficult decision to be made at the end of it. My wife gets around it by getting out of a bloody wheelchair and, <laughs> and struggling up and down steps. And that seems to be the only solution at the moment. And I would contrast that with the uh, county hall uh, and having spent some time in and around there. There are still significant problems in Shire Hall for people with wheelchairs. And it doesn't always work in their chamber. 
has been extensively changed and I still think it's not a particularly satisfactory arrangement. You are in danger of falling off a cliff in places because you're moving from an area where someone with disability would be uh, onto other areas of the chamber and I've seen people fall down that cliff and it's not been easy to manage so it's a difficulty this is a small town in, in terms of its, uh, its uh, democratic arrangements and uh, I just think that it's not going to prove particularly successful in, uh, in moving it forward. All right, Councillor Margrave. Uh, thank you Chair. I, I wanted to wait until the debate on that particular issue is sort of finished before mentioning one final thing and it was raised in relation to parking uh, and I don't want to create a debate, a political debate in this room uh, around the cost of parking. However, I do want to raise, uh, a number of residents have approached me over the years and I have got significant concerns about how we uh, deliver access to parking. So for example, if you pay your parking and you're a disabled person, you get an extra hour. But in order to access that extra hour, you have to potentially make your way to an office and make your way back to the car. And that can cause somebody who's got significant issues, potential fatigue or potential problems. So I would ask, I'm not moving a formal resolution, but I would ask that that matter be considered in relation to how we can better uh, provide that extra hour so there's, there's better take up of it. Uh, and also potentially marry it into the telephone app so people wouldn't necessarily have to get out of their car to pay. Uh, they could, you know, pay via their app, but they could add that extra hour. So it's just thinking about how we deliver that. It's not bringing into question the decision to charge, because that's a debate that's previously been had. And while I don't agree with it, that's a decision that was had when I wasn't on the council and has been in place for some time. But I do think it's important to make sure that we encourage uh, disabled people to come into our town centres and make it as seamless as possible. Thank you, Chair. Right. Can just, just do that on board. Oh, mm -hmm. well, will take that, Chair. Yeah, good job. It's been proposed and seconded that uh, we ask the Cabinet to have a look to see if we can make the council chamber more, what is that word? Accessible. Accessible. It's just as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll set that proposal. Come on, you're going to say something. I was just going to say because we've also had the thing on dementia. So if, if we're redoing the chamber, it's sort of yeah, it, it's accessible for people with all sorts of issues and uh, yeah, making it obviously dementia friendly and all the other mm -hmm. boxes to tick. So everybody in favour of trying to asking yeah. the cabinet to have a look at that to see yeah. what they can do. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right, uh, item number eight in integrated performance. Well, up you take that again? Uh, yes, Chair, if that's uh, okay with you, I will progress. Uh, um, yeah, it's okay with you. If I can, if I can um, just flag, Chair, first of all, on page 46, um, in accordance with the requirements of the uh, Office of the Surveillance Commissioner, I will draw to your attention details of the surveillance undertaken by uh, the council <coughs> under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. As you will see, the council has undertaken no surveillance under the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. However, I, I draw this to your attention because it's important when we get uh, inspected that we, we can say <coughs> that we have had oversight of the process by elected members because they're very keen to that. So, uh, I draw that to your attention. Um, Chair, uh, um, obviously you have the, the graphs and charts there, um, and if I take you over the page to the uh, financial summary, um, there's a couple of things, and, and we'll drill into these as we go through the report. Um, perhaps the most significant um, point to note is the commercial property and industrial estates, which as you will see, the forecast variance is uh, £255,000, uh, a not inconsiderable sum. Um, to some extent, that is mitigated by um, some underspends or uh, extra income, as the case may be, 
uh, which as you run down reduces that to an overspend in total against budget of £138,000. So still um, alarmingly high, but over, um, over budget. Um, if I can... You want to speak it up one time? Just, just this page, yes. I'm very concerned we've underspent on emergency planning by 12,000. We had a lot of rain at the weekend and I went down to Cleaver Gardens to make sure if it was okay. And this time we've survived. But I know in the past Andrew Dorr did an awful lot in emergency planning. Last year we only spent 17,000 on it. We had raised the budget to 50,000, we only spent 38,000. Emergency planning is really important and it's not covered, I don't think, in any of the other bits of paperwork further on. Um, I, I think we do need to actually make sure we've got all our emergency plans in place and make sure we've got the staff and yeah, if there was a catastrophic flood somewhere or fire or that we're still on top of emergency planning because Andrew Dorr was actually a marvellous officer. I know he used to go down to clean the guns when the anchor was in flood to check on the people. Totally above his, his um, duties. Above, above and beyond, yes. But let's uh, say, without people going above and beyond, we need to make sure the emergency plan's in place. Mm. Hello? Uh, well, yes, Chair. Uh, we, we obviously have an emergency plan. It is being refreshed uh, following Andrew's departure. Uh, and clearly, I can't, I, don't, I can't explain why there's an underspend there, but uh, clearly there is still work to be done, so I'm sure that that won't be the case next year. Okay. If I can turn the page, Chair, if we can do it, I'll do this by exception. Um, as you will see, the first item is on uh, page 50, uh, uh, the, the frowny face, and that's in connection with commercial properties. As you'll see, um, there are a couple of um, factors that have been um, highlighted. Obviously, we know about the 99p store on Queen's Road and, and the costs associated with that. There is also, Chair, um, in the car park behind me here um, at Church Street, uh, a number of shops there that are now uh, being that if they're not all vacant, will be vacant soon as part of the arrangements for uh, the sale of that site to McCarthy and Stone for their development, which now has planning permission. So um, we are in the process of uh, decanting tenants out. So clearly there will be an impact in terms of income for commercial properties as arising from that. That has impacted, as you know, so it's, it's added to the, the, if you like, the, 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 the spend pressures that we're, we're encountering there. Chair? In terms of empty properties, there's also a Borough Council planning application for a one to four bond gate upstairs. The Life Church was in there a while ago. So are we actually taking note of some of these for our own use? or? You, I, I can't find much out. I don't know. It's first I've heard of it. So. Um, Clearly, Chair, the, the, if I can just flag, I know we, we, we flagged this at the last meeting, but uh, on, the, on page 50, it's, it's not a smiley face, it's not a frowny face, it's just a, a face. Um, and there we've got the commercial property uh, occupation currently, and we're still looking at 4% uh, 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 vacancy. If I can... Yes, go on. Yep. Go on. If I can carry on, Chair. Um, the next um, frowny face, if I can put it in these terms, is in connection with the market. And Jonathan is here uh, with me, so I'm, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to deal with the, particularly, it's, it's the Nuneaton market in particular. You'll see that uh, uh, we have a frowny face. So I don't know whether you want to explain or. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I've now done my first 12 months in, in post. Um, and it was interesting to see the seasons and how the market did alter, because it does alter dramatically through the seasons. The, certainly the last sort of six months have brought their own challenges in relation to the amount of inclement weather that we've had. And as a consequence, we've had, had to cancel a number of markets for high winds and for snow. In terms of the uh, figures up to the end of the third qu quarter, that does take into account two ma uh, markets that were cancelled, 
one Wednesday market and one Saturday market. Um, and if you take the effectively the average um, uh, occupancy rates for a Saturday of 120 and that of a Wednesday of 95, and take those into consideration, bearing in mind we didn't have, as I can find anyway, any uh, cancelled markets the previous year, that would actually, if you added those in, would actually bring us into a positive position of 46 stores um, up to the end of the third quarter. So that drop really is obviously as a direct result of those two cancelled markets in that period. Um, it is worth noting that we have since over the Christmas period, cancelled a further three markets, um, one Saturday and two Wednesdays, again as a consequence of the, the challenges we faced in terms of in inclement weather. Um, one thing that I would also like to add, um, I've had a look at from April 17 to April 18, the number of actual traders that we have lost and gained, um, both on the Saturday and Wednesday. Um, and in terms of the traders, we, we've actually lost seven in the last 12 months um, who had a total of 13 stalls. But we've gained 13 traders um, with a, a, a 22 stalls. So we've actually taken on an additional six traders during that 12-month that period. Um, the market is clearly a big asset to this town centre. Uh, I am convinced that it is one of the strongest markets in the area. Uh, what I don't think we've done particularly well in the past is shout about it and promote it and go out there and actively attract traders, which is something that we are working on now. We are, well, we'll very shortly be launching a markets website which will um, provide details of both Nuneaton and Bedworth market and of the traders present and give us opportunities as well to try and attract new traders and take that opportunity as well really to try and encourage some startup businesses perhaps to use the market as a stepping stone into taking the, 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 the first uh, steps into a new business venture. Go on, Tom Hargrove. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the update. I, I <coughs> am concerned about this but I'm more concerned about it if you take into the other figures that kind of give us an indication metric of how the town centre is doing. Uh, and so if you take into account car parking, for example, and you just take a walk around the town centre in Nuneaton, uh, it's not what it was in its heyday, and we have seen significant decline. The positive thing is that as a local authority, we're doing well on renting out properties that we've got, but obviously there's a lot in the private sector hands and portfolios. So I was actually going to raise earlier the issue about startup support and really think about how that can support markets. So I wonder whether you've been working with the Growth Hub, but I also wondered what your feeling really is about the town centre as well uh, in relation to the current situation we're in. Yeah. And just being realistic about you know, I don't want us to sugarcoat this. I want us to be realistic about where we are and then talk about where we can go. Yeah. Well, I think it's, firstly, it's very dangerous to be in a position where we sugarcoat it. We have got to be honest with ourselves about where we are, um, what the national picture is. Um, we'll all be familiar with Maplings having disappeared, Toys R Us, um, Claire's have gone into administration, Claire's accessories, um, Select are in trouble. You look at reduced number of stores. So the national picture is, is tough. And that's really, we're reaching that point now where these companies were certainly large 25 year, 30 year leases back in the heydays, and these are coming to fruition now. And they're looking at each of their individual portfolios, and if those properties aren't property, they're profitable, then they're looking at them individually. So the national picture is tough, and we will see further closures, there's no doubt about that, in terms of the nationals. Where I have a concern in particular is around startup and uh, a, a, attracting the independent businesses <coughs> because that's where we can potentially fill some of the short, um, um, shortfalls in terms of retail space. Speaking to the businesses who have expressed interest in the town centres, the, 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 the kind of obstacles that they face are the costs. If you look at the number of where we have got vacant units, a number of those are three-storey properties. 
Um, one business example was looking at a, a, a property in Abbey Street where it was £29,000. Three storeys, they didn't want three storeys. They wanted a single unit on the bottom to, to do retail or, or, or food and drink. We've got to engage and get the buy-in with the landlords and the property owners who own the properties outside of our own portfolio and we've got to get them to buy in to that, that fact. That's easier said than done in certain instances because some of these are owned by uh, property uh, portfolio holders who really are interested in, in maintaining the value of their portfolio because they use that to, to borrow money against and, and various other bits. The local landlords are clearly more interested in offsetting some of their, their rates liability and, and doing deals to, to, to let these, but we have got to get that connection and that's got to form part of a wider scheme and plan in relation to how we're going to develop the town centre. We can't rely anymore on our town centre being about purely a retail offer to drive the town centre. And it's interesting to see what the LEP was saying there in terms of technology, uh, not so much engineering, but certainly technology, startup businesses, incubation units, this kind of stuff. We need to have a look at how we can accommodate those within any future plans for our town centre. Chair, can I just say that's fantastic. That's absolute music to my ears. Uh, you, you know, when I, going back to when I was sort of 16, 15, 16, and on the youth council, uh, and we had a town centre manager then, I promoted some of the things that you're saying, and, and they haven't really come to fruition. But some of the some of the ideas that you've spoken about really give me confidence in your work, and and I I think it's really important to promote the experience on the high street because people don't come into a town centre necessarily to buy things; they come in to experience something. And part of that is about having incubators for businesses to start up, small retail spaces, uh, and it's about the marketing mix really that's on offer. So. I just want to support what's been said and uh, call on the cabinet to do anything they can do to support it. Thank you. Councillor Yeah, um, in its heyday, the market had 13,000 stalls in the meeting, so the targets have slipped a lot. One thing I did ask a few years ago is can we ask for our, can we pay business rates on the market? Yes. Can we actually ask for rate revaluation or have we on the market? Because although business rates come partly back to us, I think we keep it only about 40%. So actually if we could revalue the market, there might be an opportunity to take out a, a, a bit of cost there. It's great you've taken out some of the transport costs, and I think we need to be looking at actually reducing the market rents as we've actually taken some costs out to actually raise the number of stalls, because obviously you've got the Ryanair model where you have more but cheaper. Uh, and one thing, if we may have more but cheaper market rents, we may actually take more on the parking because we've actually got empty car parking spaces now. So actually trying to look at the two, market rent and car parking together rather than silos, actually getting more people in the more market, cheaper market rent may actually, although we might lose £10,000 on a promotion of market stalls, we might gain £10,000 on parking income. So we do need to look on that. And you were quite right that we haven't actually shouted about the market for a few years, but we did an awful lot of that around 2008, 2010, when we were an award-winning market. Uh, I, I always said it was a massive mistake making our town centre manager redundant a few years ago. And we've reversed that now, we've got you on board, but we do need to actually use you and actually give you the ability to give discounts or change pricing structures to actually make us successful and get away from this, the rent is this and the, the sort of bureaucratic thing we used to have. I think, I mean, I have looked very carefully and spent a lot of time in the last 12 months looking at the operation of all of the areas within my control and the market does give me raise, uh, reason for concern in relation to the operation and we've made adjustments in, in terms of the structure and the personnel involved in that as well. So we're working through that um, because I do think it's, it's a balance between driving the revenue and reducing the costs. And there are opportunities, I think, to reduce some of the costs in terms of the operation. And there are, there are, there are a number of projects that we're looking at, at in relation to that. Um, it is a strong market uh, and we, we, are, we can attract uh, traders from elsewhere. Um, by promoting it, it'd be interesting to see what it is. For the first time, we will have 
more measures in place as well. I'm, I'm reviewing all of the KPIs in relation to the market, so we're not looking at a single KPI really in relation to this, that it needs to be a bit more, more balanced. Um, and I, I, we will be able to measure, measure footfall across the, the areas of the town centre as well very shortly, which will help significantly as well in terms of future planning and, 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 and <coughs> what we do. Um, it may well be that, you know, as part of that for the market, we look at, you know, primary and secondary locations there and, and rents accordingly, but clearly at the moment it's, it, it's operating at a large deficit and we need to try and reduce that as much as possible as well um, for everybody's benefit, really. Can we just come back a little... Go on, on, yeah, the, the one thing they also put on to you was the idea of having a five-day week fruit and veg store. Yes. We've got the, we got the um, flower yeah. store every day. Yeah. Flowers yeah. aren't useful for keeping people in healthy no. living. They're good for the mind. No. And one of the things that came back as feedback is you'd suggested a very out of the way for that. <coughs> and I think we do need to try and get a fruit and veg store back yeah. in the town five days a week from the healthy living point of view and from getting people in. Because if there's a fruit and veg store rather than having to get to Iceland yeah. or somewhere, it'd be a big attraction. There are areas that I'd, I'd sort of identified where I'd like to do that, and not just fruit and veg, maybe a juice. I mean, we've got the, the new gym, perfect location just off Coventry Street there, to create almost like a five-day week mini market, if you like, if we can pitch that correctly and attract the right traders, but it's got to be the right balance. We are seeing a large increase as well in the number of food vendors, and we did try some specialist food markets in the summer, which went down... You know, well, but they're it, they're not sustainable, particularly necessarily on a week-to-week -week basis. And then, but specialist markets we still need to explore as well. But fruit and veg really important, and I say they're they're doing very well at the hospital, having a fruit and yes, veg yeah. up at the hospital. Yet yeah, there's not one five days a week in the town no. centre. Council Holland, uh, Chairman, just moving away from micromanaging this manager. Because uh, I feel if we get down into much more detail, we'll be examining your socks. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. It's, it's just a question arising from this uh, LEP presentation. Yeah. There's transforming Nuneaton, £7.6 million. Pounds. Yeah. What, what's going to happen with that £7.6 million pounds to solve some of your real problems, which I think are about voids, and lack of footfall in sometimes uh, in the town centre. How is it going to transform what we find when we come into Nuneaton well, that will help with all the problems you have? Yeah, I, I mean I can't comment directly on the seven point <coughs> five million and how that's spent. That sits with 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 Les in terms of the economic regeneration team. However, um, what there has to be a, a balance of is that we have all of the towns across the country have been pretty much over. Um, overstock with retail space and that is reducing yeah. the town centres are reducing so we need to understand what we can use that um, vacant um, a retail space for and that's where obviously that fits in with the um, regenerating non-eaten plans and, and it's been uh, challenging the norm and being innovative in terms of what we can do it doesn't have to be and this is no disrespect to the LEP where I get uh, slightly frustrated that it's if it's manif um, okay, not manufacturing but if it's tech or what have you it sits outside in an industrial estate whereas it's not considered as an option to come into town centres if we create the right kind of incubation space. Yeah. Equally the importance now of leisure into town centres is something that we are slightly limited here with in terms of the representation in the town centre. Something that will hold people, particularly the families as well and and again while there is so much that it can do may affect in the short term the long term will potentially obviously inquire that investment to create the right kind of premises to attract that I mean your 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 family change your Nando's and these kind of people aren't going to move into a vacant unit that was I don't know whatever mappings or something like that they'll want a purpose space of a certain square foot but that's ready for them just to move into. And we've got to, if we're going to attract that kind of business, we've got to create that kind of space for them. And that's where the transforming the Neaton element comes in. Yeah. I think that um, everything has been said has been very positive. And the job that you're doing is looking at everything that, uh, that is possible. Because you know, politics at the end of the day is the art of the possible rather than the impossible. So the, the comments have been made. And, However, it seems to be 
looking forward to see what happens in the next year, I suppose. Yeah. See what happens there. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Sorry, sorry, hang on. Um, we haven't got to you yet. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you turn them over the page, Chair, you'll see that there's um, a frowny face for rent allowances and rent rebates. Probably uh, this register things to do, so have to wait. Um, there is a, a what, what, what I thought was an anomaly in the figures there because, of course, the budget is 197,000 and the third quarter outturn is 796,000 with a year in of 23,000. Um, I've been reliably informed that is correct, that 796,000, and it's all to do with the way that uh, uh, payments are received. Um, I understand that they, that will come down. And that the uh, forecast out to at least actually seventy six thousand pounds. So um, you'll see there, chair, that there is it's um, a number of factors that have contributed to that. Uh, but as I understand it, that um, we will for we are forecasting that seventy six thousand uh, pound overspend. Moving on to uh, claims, new claims, again there is uh, a deterioration, it's a, it's a trend analysis as you'll see um, and that new claims are taking slightly longer than they did last year um, but um, the bottom line is that the um, benchmark figure is 22 days and we're still uh, comfortably within that um, so uh, uh, I'm right with them on my phone colleagues that uh, they are um, obviously disappointed that it's not as good as last year but there are contributing factors in terms of um, processing of claims which is um, obviously as you can imagine is increasing um, in some cases uh, with universal credit it's becoming a bit more uh, challenging uh, to work out who's doing what. Um, the council tax collection chair is the next one on page 55. Again, uh, deterioration in terms of trend uh, and a, a slight underperformance against target. Um, I understand that there are some uh, efforts being made uh, within the uh, Revs and Benz team to ramp up uh, collection rates, but of course, um, as you know, um, it, 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 um, it has affected a lot of people, austerity, and a lot of, a lot of people are struggling to, to, to pay. Just on that point, people can pay their capital <coughs> tax as 10 payments over 10 months of the 2-month gap, or over 12 months, a slightly smaller payment where you have to pay 12 of them. Are we actively promoting that for people who are struggling? Because obviously they're getting behind on paying it over 10 months, but if they're actually asked, they could pay it over 12 months. I don't know, Chair, I can ask the question. I can also clarify whether the profile takes that into account as well. Well, for my vote. Thank you, Chair. In relation to the council tax element, how much do you feel that with the changes to universal credit, but also because of austerity and, and other reasons, lots of people find themselves either unemployed or in work and on very low incomes? Uh, obviously, we unlike some other authorities, choose to levy council tax on people who are on some benefits. Do you think that has an impact in relation to their ability to pay? And how does that bear out in these figures? I don't know about how it bears out, but I think it's an, almost a truism to say that if we're levying it, then it will have an impact. Um, quite what that impact is. Into, in, in reality, I don't know, and I'd have to ask my colleagues to come back and comment on whether or not they're experiencing particular difficulties. Um, I think it's fair to say that we know that, um, it's, that the issue is normally people who are in work, but as you say, on, on low pay, and therefore are then having uh, difficulties, partly because, of course, uh, of the, 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 if you like, the wage squeeze and the, the difference between inflation and wage increases. Which is going to ask the question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm now going to move to car parking and cash uh, on page 57. Um, there you will see that um, there, there is a, a, 
an indication in terms of uh, ticket sales and um, third quarter income. I'm going to invite Cash just to uh, appraise you of current position and where we're going. Okay. Cheers, well, thank you. Um, yeah, it, 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 there has been a, a disappointing reduction from, from third quarter of 2016 to the third quarter of 2018, based to about three, three and a half percent drop in income. And in terms of ticket sales, that's four and a half percent in ticket, no. ticket sales. And um, there seems to be a pattern of the last few years, and the pattern reflects the, the fall in, 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 in footfall. Coming down, and you know, I don't want to remind you, but we we have had two flagship shops closed in the last couple of years: the Co-op, BHS, and they they put pulled in quite, quite, quite a few customers into into our car park, into the town centres. Um, but also looking at the the, the last quarter, 2017, they, they started off with this uh, American uh, phenomenon. There, there, there was one black. black, black uh, Black Friday, but in November last year they seemed to have about three or four Black Fridays. It got quite confusing, and and uh, on, online online shopping is um, is also is also increasing. Um, click click and and, and collect um, um, places are also opening up more and uh, and more. Um, we, we also had um, in December, middle of December, we, we had six snowfalls for, for, for about two days, two, two consecutive days. Um, the ice conditions that, that maintained after that didn't, it didn't help. Whilst we were spreading salt in the car parks to, to, make, to make sure they were open, um, quite, quite a few drivers quite, quite rightly chose not to use the uh, car <coughs> parks. Um, so those sort of factors have unfortunately Resulting in this continued drop, unfortunately, in, in, in income and in ticket 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 sales. Um, so, uh, obviously, we we do work closely with with our colleagues. We don't work in silos. Work closely with, 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 with the town centre group, and we're hoping that with the more special events coming up um, of the next few months, that should that should attract more more people. In, into the uh, borough, into uh, our car parks, and hopefully increase the customer sales. Council Condor Clark. A couple of points. One, in the last year we've had Pure Gym open, and we're offering their customers free parking. So it'd be useful to know how many tickets we think we've given away free to poor Pure Gym, if there's a, a number on that. Um, and secondly, with the car parking income going down, is there any actual car parks where you know, we're paying business rates and various charges where we need to actually review whether some of the outlying car parks like Orchard Street or the ones around the back of uh, Vicarage Street or whether, whether actually we need to, to look at changing what we do with them, whether they stay car parks or whether we get someone else to operate them or, or something to do to... Mm -hmm. so, if we've got less income, because it looks like we take £3 million pounds a year, just sorry, £2 million pounds a year, just yeah. under on car parking income, but we actually, our end of year forecast is a few hundred thousand pounds. So all the business rates and all the things that get taken off that and charges, um, yeah, actually mean we don't actually make physically, as a book profit, that much profit on it. So actually reducing the portfolio would actually take the overheads down. Okay, well, that's I can, I, can, I can always go back and ask, ask that, that question. Councillor Margaret. Thanks, Chair. Just to point out to Councillor Condacorp, we're not legally allowed to make profit on car parks, is my understanding. Uh, to, just, just to point that out, I think that's quite an important thing to be aware of. Uh, well, we so are. Can I, can I, uh, if, if, if they cancel car parks, don't by the council, you, yes, you, 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 you can make, make a profit. You're not, you're, you're not allowed to make a uh, profit from on on street uh, uh, par par parking par par parking tickets. That has to be reinvested into uh, tra trans uh, transport schemes. But well, within car parks, yes, you, 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 you can. I've make got profit. no problem with making a profit, but my understanding was that we weren't allowed to set out to make a profit. That was it. 
but but we we we, we can. Um, we can generate surfaces chair as long as they're reinvested either into transport infrastructure or into parks, play, open space, that sort of service. But, it, but in any case, like, I've got a, just a quick question really, just to understand these figures. Is it that these figures are down to, as, as opposition members often say, what was an alleged hike in fees, or is it to do with as you've possibly pointed to the, the four in football. So I, I just wonder whether you've done any analysis in relation to what was causing this. Uh, because if it is the fees, then that would have to be looked at. But my understanding is this is down to people using online and other things that are going on within the high school. But I'd be interested in an independent view from an officer. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a, a, a combination of all of those. There is a national trend in football has fallen nationally in town centre. It's like four percent nationally. That, that, that came out uh, just after the, the Christmas period. And, and I think the, on, the online shopping uh, phenomenon it, it, it isn't dwindling, it's actually, it's actually growing. Um, and, and so it, uh, our, our tariffs have been frozen now. For two years, we, we haven't raised tariffs, and the tariff levels are set were, were fairly uh, competitive with uh, other car, car, car parks in uh, uh, other town centres nearby. Um, so I think if I if I was to give you an answer, I would I would I would say that the footfall fall is the the, the main uh, uh, factor. I think the thing for the future is uh, Tom Tent, the manager, was saying that we're going to look at football and uh, not do this in the future. See what's happening and see what we can do. We don't know what's happened. still don't know what's happened with the bids that were supposed to be happening. Is uh, anything happening along the way? Yeah, they, they've currently got the application in for funding yeah. uh, and they should be hearing them within the next month or so in relation to whether they've, they've been successful on that and that will obviously determine where they are from there uh, and then it's about an 18 month process for them to go through so we, we're potentially still you know just under two years away from a successful bid if they were able to secure the, the necessary funds. Okay, that's something else which we'll be able to do. Online shopping, I'm sure which we will do. Anything else, Philip? Uh, just, chair, just to move on to the uh, risk register, we have two reds uh, showing, and the first one is on page 61, which is R2, uh, which is obviously the failure to deliver the borough plan. Um, just one point to note, really, on the plan that the second stage examination in public, February 18, has now been concluded. Uh, so we're going to move to uh, the next <coughs> stage in the process. Um, there might still be some residual stuff that needs to follow on, but uh, we would expect to be getting uh, a, a response from the inspector with a draft report sometime in June, July time, uh, and then with a view possibly of reporting to September Council. So um, that, uh, that, that will be picked up at the next review of the uh, Strategic Risk Register. Um, the other red chair is on, uh, which is R4, which is on page 65. Sorry, I, sorry, it's not R4 chair, sorry. It, it's, um, let's come back to R4 in, in a moment. Uh, it's, um, R14 on page 79. Um, that is obviously uh, a, a connection with information management, uh, and you'll see that there is a, 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 it's a red risk principally because of the new uh, general data protection regulation, uh, which comes into force on the 25th of May. Um, there are a number of planned mitigations including the Employment <coughs> Protection Office uh, training programme, data audit and compliance programme. Those are all in train now. We have appointed data protection officer 
um, and we are in the process of um, addressing the, the, the data audit and the processes necessary to bring us into compliance with the GDPR, um, which uh, obviously is of significance principally because the um, a breach of the GDPR carries with it potentially a fine of 20 million euros or 4% of gross turnover, depending whichever is the, I think it's the, the greater. <laughs> so quite a significant penalty for failing to comply. So hence it's pretty, pretty important to comply. Um, Just in relation to, to this, do we know what the loss of income will potentially be? Because my understanding is that there's a change to the statutory fee, isn't there? Is there? Um, in terms of... That so there's, so there's when somebody applies, so let's say somebody makes a subject access... Oh, right, okay. um, I wasn't sure whether that was a risk. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was a significant risk. The, um, the um, subject access requests currently carry a fee of £10. Uh, that will go. Um, I think the, the, the bigger question mark isn't over that because we don't get many of those anyway. We don't budget for it. Um, the real risk is more to do with the Information Commissioner now looking at altering the fee scales for notifications. Um, it wasn't clear what that was going to be and I'm not entirely sure whether they've actually fixed a fee yet. I'm going to have to come back to you on that but that's the unknown because uh, I understand that like uh, all government agencies they are um, feeling the squeeze so to speak and they may see the opportunity to uh, offset some of the uh, reductions in grant income from central government by increasing their fees. So um, I'll need to come back to you on that between now and the day after. Anybody else? Yep. Can I take you back chair then to page 65? Uh, and I want to pick up a couple of points here. One of them, I think, has already been touched upon, which is the bid, which is on page 67, um, and that's in train. Um, it did get raised last week at the um, uh, Planning and Environment OSP in connection with item 6 on page 65, which is the budget to improve town centres. I thought, as you've got Jonathan here, I'd preempt the question and ask Jonathan just to give a quick outline of where we are with the £200,000 improvements uh, uh, budget to improve town centres? I circled it, so... so I'll okay. really, uh... <laughs> um, yeah, <coughs> the, the, the major project there was around the Wi-Fi and the footfall counting. They are now actually <coughs> up on the poles, just ready for the electrics to be connected, so hopefully within two weeks we'll have <coughs> a system that will then soft launch for a month or so to make sure everything's as it should be before doing a formal launch in relation to that. Um, and what I'm planning to do is do that as part of a digital launch alongside the town centre's website, which has got full business listings on it, information about local events, all of that kind of stuff for both the towns and the, the market website as well. So we do a, a town centre's digital launch, um, and, and that accounts for about 50% of the total budget. Uh, the Wi Fi and uh, GeoSense uh, were £85,000. Um, it was originally quoted at ninety-six, but I managed to get £11,000 off when I started off the original quote. Um, don't tell the let they want it back. No. Well, I don't think the let no, no, contributes to council. Oh, is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we've got various other schemes. We, we did some um, cosmetic improvements uh, in sort of spring last year with the uh, town centre clean, the deep cleans, that cost about £30,000 of that money. And then other programmes really relate to improvements to the markets, including Bedworth Market, where we've just done an exterior improvements on that, and we've got uh, internal works going on, as well as taking down the existing static stalls to open up the space to create a more versatile space for uh, other events as well as markets when we haven't got a market day on as well so uh, we've invested additional money in that. There are further improvements with the town centres we've taken away the old planters and we'll be bringing in less but new planters onto key gateways welcome and big into the town centre um, looking at the bins as well and, and various other bits and pieces 
I've got a total of about 187,000 of that 200,000 allocated for various projects, so a little bit of contingency in there as well. Okay, some good enough. Councilor Condor, did you have to get? Yes, uh, on this for a few things. We have 13,000, a few improved for cycling would be useful. Okay. Because the cycling racks um, are all over the place, uh, quite often beyond where you're allowed to cycle to. And cyclists do spend a lot of money because uh, they don't have a car to spend money on sometimes. So a few things about those sort of those niches. I'm not saying spend it all on cycling, but just look at a few things like cycling where a few people might be put off if the, the environment's not friendly. Yeah. And they do actually do cycling planters where they actually planters with bars and they actually sign to big piece so people know where to park their bikes. Right. And there's a lot of bike thefts in the town centre. Yeah. So the more we can sort of tie in some investment and try to reduce the crime in the town centre would actually have a positive bearing. Um, on a totally different issue but still on R4, I'm appalled about the Abbey Street development being keep being put down as being mitigating, planned, etc. And it seems from the emails that Philip sent me last couple of days that St James's the development partner was dropped two years ago um, and the Abbey Street project, as we know, is in deep problems and yet we keep saying everything's okay, we've got all these projects and in fact they're built on sand. So I do think we actually need a, a bit of a review on the work programme about the Abbey Street project because we put tens of thousands of pounds in it and we're not quite sure what it is. We get these statements at the full council saying prime marks coming or marks and spencers might be coming every election time. And actually we're just chucking money down a drain for some consultants who who knows what they're doing and if they're still in business. No. Are we still in As far as I know, Chair, yes. Okay then. Yes. Anything else? Nope. Chair, the only other um, just, just, just side note to make is on page 66, um, item 8, I'm questioning whether we can squeeze another 100,000 into that from the left, because they seem to think they're giving us 7.6 million, or the county council 7.6 million, and we're, 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 we're reporting it at 7.5, so I think we'll just need to see whether there's another 100,000 pounds lurking in the ether there somewhere. I have to say everything I've seen says 7.5, but if it was 7.6, all the better. Uh, I should add that that is going to the county, not to us. So. Um, Tony? Well, just in relation to the business improvement district, I wonder where we were in relation to that coming to fruition, just as an mitigation. We have answered that about 15 minutes ago. Uh, they, they currently have their application in for funding for the foundation stages and they should know within the next four to weeks or so whether No, 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 but sorry, what I meant was obviously it's down here as a yeah. mitigation and I just think, wonder whether it needed updating in relation to where they are and... Oh, right, okay. I just didn't know whether it had any bearing on the, the risk. Not, not at this stage, Chair, until, until um, they have the funding. Yeah they will not be in a position to move forward. Because they will take more responsibility, won't they, potentially, for some things. So um, they'll have more involvement, and so... Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I, I was involved with business improvement for, for quite a long time. Um, there's the view that really they shouldn't be in a position to take over or replace Okay. Local authority services, but they can complement or add to. Yeah. We, have, so more we have the baseline services because yes. the bid cannot, f the bid levy cannot fund the delivery of existing services. Yeah. It has to be in, a, in addition. There has to be additionality to it. So they can augment an existing service, but they cannot deliver the core service. Can I just clarify? Because I thought one of the things the bid did was take over things like the Christmas light switch on and promotions which are done more by the business community rather than the council fireworks that don't go off. <laughs> don't. <laughs> yes. It was a long day, that was the yeah. I thought I thought I asked a question at the beginning of the year about how much money the, um, the companies actually put into the Christmas lights, etc. And I don't think it's any, is it? Yeah, it's nothing. We, got, we secured some sponsorship for the Christmas tree. 
Um, and no, they, they have in previous years, as I understand it, contributed to the, the light switch on. Mm -hmm. um, I understand. Yeah. But, but we didn't pay for the uh, fireworks, obviously. We did pay for not in Not in the need, no, we didn't. No. Did we get a rebate for that? Uh, yes, we didn't. They, 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 they didn't pay any. They didn't pay. We didn't pay. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for reasons of non-performance. Yeah. It was perfect in Bedworth. Yeah, there you go. I'll make a note. Cool. Go there next time. There you go. Thank you, Chair. Just lastly, on page 84, you have the Strategic Performance Report summary up to the date of the end of December. Uh, largely, it's covering off the, um, the stuff we <coughs> touched upon in terms of some of the key indicators for this uh, particular panel. Um, there is um, Perhaps I'm just looking for it to see where it is. One little bit of an update that I can give you uh, on page 86. Uh, we've got uh, the uh, under processing <coughs> working days lost due to uh, absence. Um, I haven't got, well, I have, but I haven't got it with me. Um, the overall um, result is. For, for the council for the year. So up to the end of 31st of March this year, we have come in under the nine working days, which is um, our, our sort of target for the year. Um, so we, 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 we're well under on, on, on that, I understand. Um, we're slightly over on short term, but well under on long term, which is a sort of flipping over of the uh, trends from previous years. Uh, but um, so we, we, we've, that's a pretty good start. Um, I've seen some information in connection with Rugby Borough Council who look as if they were reporting a, a, a 12 day um, loss for full time equipment by way of just to give a bit of a benchmark to give you a flavour of it. So we, we've done better this year than we said we did last year. Would I that one then? <laughs> Thanks, you're concerned. Um, other than that, Chair, I've got nothing further to add. You have obviously all the other information before you have uh, uh, any questions. Councilor Glenda Barnes. Uh, just while you're on that, page 87's got the ambers, um, and I believe a lot of these ambers are still red. Council, seven ambers. Council House sales still haven't happened. The waste permit expected end of January hasn't happened. Um, disposal of St Mary's Road, has that happened? Um, Vicarage Street stuff, I say this list of ambers all seem to be things that are all going wrong at the moment. I don't know if any of them have actually progressed since the end of December, which is when this report says they happened. Uh, I wouldn't say they're going wrong, Chair, but certainly they've not happened. Um, as uh, The council house, I understand, we're waiting now. The, the, the um, prospective purchasers now need to obtain their planning permission. I understand. I keep being told that they are preparing a planning application which will be submitted any day. So, uh, as far as I know, that is happening. Um, the um, council services from St Mary's Road Depot, um, well, that's happened. The services have been relocated with the exception of the uh, waste management licence element um, for the transfer station. I understand that is happening as well. Um, the dispose of St Mary's Road Depot, uh, again, we are close to uh, the app, um, purchasers exercising their option. They haven't yet exercised it, but we are in the process of putting all the necessary um, uh, processes in place. And this is more to do with the land transaction than it is to do with anything else. Um, and we're, we're, we're progressing that, so that is also happening. Um, and. Clearly, as uh, members know, there is work happening in connection with transforming Uneaton, which picks up the Vicarage Street site. That is happening. Uh, and um, I, I, I'm not quite sure where we are in terms of Smart's farm. I think um, that may well have taken a bit of a knock, possibly due to a planning decision. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's the same site, but there was certainly something which. Uh, may have uh, affected that, um, but um, in terms of the Abbey Street car park development, I think we've already touched upon that as well, and that there are um, obviously um, 
Les Snowden and his team are currently working with consultants to try and put the package together to uh, bring forward a proposal for consideration by the council. So oh. again, so um, I think the reason that they're amber as opposed to red is that there are things happening, they just haven't yet come to fruition where we can tick the box and say we've done that and we can now move on. Uh, but um, as is the case, all of them are progressing, some quicker than others, but there are things happening on all of those projects. Uh, with the exception, I think, of the um, review of small and medium operation and other buildings to identify any that should be disposed of uh, to the third and voluntary groups for use. Um, the only thing that we are doing in connection with that is obviously we're reviewing all our pavilions with a view to um, negotiating asset transfers with um, uh, particular clubs in order to be able to um, ensure that those assets can be enhanced and delivered and maintained going forward as our uh, assets and resources are reducing. We are hoping that certain clubs will be able to take on some of the responsibility for keeping those assets going and available for use by the community. Very quickly, come to a the King's Hound one. It does say it's unviable and we're keeping a watching brief, so that sounds like it's stalled to me. And the firm we're working with, St James Investment Development, has been wound up. We are now paying money to St James's Group, which is a different firm and there's a big governance issue over what's going on. We can't just keep paying money out for the Abbey Street stuff without knowing what it's for and where it's going. Well, I can't comment on uh, the, the, the specifics, Chair. Uh, you know, clearly, as I say, things are happening. Work is being done. Um, as you can imagine, as with any commercial transaction, we have to be very careful about what we say uh, in public. Um, this is not the sort of thing that can be readily uh, discussed in, in a public forum because of the sensitivities around that. So um, all I can suggest, Chair, at this stage is um, we, will, we will, when we get to a point where there is it's a milestone that where we can report something, it will be reported. It's, uh, it's on tunnel under two. Very, very clearly that it's uh, some positive things are happening, not this negativity of the debt, <coughs> woe is me, and all this sort of thing. As somebody who believes in the glass half full, we have something to do with my name. The glass half full rather than half empty is um, something I think that we should be looking forward to rather than the negativity of trying to down the town, woe is me, and woe is me, and eating our woe is bed with. Things are happening. Yeah. Not as quick as not as quick as we hope they're going to happen, but they're happening. Yeah, with respect, I'd like to know they're happening, and which is why even if we have to hold a meeting in private to discuss Abbey Street, I would like us to know that we're actually making progress and what we're spending money on. It's not being negative, it's actually being scrutiny. Compared to the other things you were noting about amber, 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 then you pick on one subject rather than the, the five or six you indicated beforehand, things are happening to them. Right, item number 10, forward plan. Oh, me, oh. um, the, just to finish off on this um, performance report, there is the uh, Freedom of Information and Complaints information yeah. on the um, papers. Um, I just wanted to run something past you. Um, the last two OSPs that have received this information has, um, well, they're, they're a bit um, unsure as to how to take it forward. Partly because they're not sure what to do with it. Partly because they don't feel that there's enough information on here. So what they've requested is that in future, instead of just the reference number, we give a brief description as to what it's about. So whether it's a missed bin or whether it's um, a, a, an overhanging tree or what it, whatever the actual um, complaint or uh, information request might be about. And I was going to go a little bit further than that, Chair, and suggest that this report was put on here at the request of this panel 
because of the re review it undertook on the <coughs> complaints and, and FOI um, procedure, which is why you've been having the um, update tonight. So can I suggest that, um, that maybe in future this length, the, this re, you know, sort of this whole report comes to yourselves to monitor with that additional bit of information so you know better what it's about. And if you have any issues that something's taking a particularly long time or you don't understand why one particular area is um, performing particularly badly, that you then send that to the relevant OSP. But we don't actually have to reproduce this to every OSP. That's what I'm looking for, basically. It seems common sense, I was just Go on, we all want to go first. Um, I think in order to agree or disagree with that, we need to know what the future of OSPs are moving forwards in terms of how many there's going to be and what they're going to be looking at. I can't tell you. I can tell you there's going to be two because that's already been approved at Council. How they're going to be divvied up, who, what work's going to be in which, I, I can't say because I don't know. Council? I was going to say the same, Chair. I think it's a sorry state of affairs when the executive determines how it is scrutinised. We, do, we are one month away from annual council almost and we still don't know how scrutiny is going to be formed. When we've looked at reviewing scrutiny in the past it has been done on a cross-party, uh, working party basis and I think it is unacceptable that we as a scrutiny committee, or all the scrutiny committees actually, are being treated in this way. The council, full council has made the decision and that decision, as far as I don't know, still well, perhaps you know more about what we're going to do than the rest of this chair. Comments on that? I think the full council made a decision on what the budget for the scrutiny chairs was. It didn't actually discuss what the format of these mm. chairs was. And if we have two chairs, we may have two chairs but four committees. Yeah. The, we haven't had a debate on scrutiny. We've had a debate on the fact we need to halve the cost of the scrutiny chairs, mm. so, which is why they said there'd be two chairs. We also have the issue of the staff looking after scrutiny and the cuts to them as well. Scrutiny is really important. If we have scrutiny right, hopefully we'll have less disasters like the climbing wall. So good scrutiny costing a few thousand pounds can actually stop us wasting hundreds of thousands. So we, we, we can't just say, oh, we voted on only having half the scrutiny. We should never vote on having half the scrutiny. We should have a proper cross-party debate on scrutiny. And it's also that uh with uh, the new arrangements with, uh, instead of just, just having the borough manager, or borough, whatever you want to call them, that's all been done. The council's agreed to that, and we'll set the new process up. If we're in power, that may, or perhaps if the Conservatives yeah. are in power. But interesting. I wouldn't be interested to see what the Conservatives would do, but I'd be interested to see what happens in May. There's a legal requirement for scrutiny, though, Chair. I'm all in favour of scrutiny, always have been. There is, there is a legal requirement that the council conduct scrutiny. Yeah. There isn't a legal requirement for the districts for them to have a scrutiny designated officer. That sits with the county. Yeah, we shall see what happens. Anything else, shall we? Um, the, well, Chair, there was just the forward plan there for information that's just uh, recently been updated. I think there was only a couple of items added from last <coughs> Um, which was, I can find it, which was, or is this the old one? I think this was already published right. before this is the new one was. Right, mm -hmm. sorry, it doesn't have the two new items on because it's the old one. And then, um, just to say, Chair, that the, uh, the OSP has completed um, most of its work programme this year, um, with just on the last back page, there are the four items there that haven't been concluded. Um, obviously, they can go forward to next year, and a decision can be made as to whether you want to retain them or. We'll um, pass them on to the next. Yeah. Well, I have a variation yeah. will really help you. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so okay. other than that, share that's it from me.
Yeah, okay, this is the last meeting. I'd like to thank everybody for, for their attendance over the year. We've covered some major, major subjects, I think. I think the next year is going to be a bit more difficult as well. And those of you who have chosen not to be in the limelight next next time around, the best of luck. Good night. Can we thank the officers as well for that? Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Well, we've got to just do that. The support staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there still a phone? I don't know, Kelly. Is there still a phone? I don't think so because we don't use them phones anymore. Phones have been scrapped. It's all digital now. You'll have to go to the label room.